First Wednesdays is sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council and by the Kellogg Hubbard Library with video production supported by Orca Media. Executive Director of the Kellogg Harvard Library. It's great to have you with us on this first Wednesday of April. It's great to have a full house. This is one of the, the many Palm City events we have scheduled throughout the month of April. Uh, for those of you who were here a few minutes ago, you already heard an unsolicited promotion to Palm City. <laughs> this is the 10th year that the Kellogg Harvard Library has presented this series. <laughs> if, if you don't have a program already, there are plenty of them on the way in. The so, this is also part of the Vermont Humanities Council's First Wednesdays Humanities Lecture Series. Humanities Council offers these uh, presentations throughout the state of Vermont, and the Kellogg Harvard Library is very pleased to be the local host for this. Tonight, well, I first got to thank the statewide underwriters for for the Humanities Council uh, series: the Alma Gibbs, Gibbs Donchian Foundation, Vermont Department of Libraries, and the Wyndham Foundation. And the underwriter for tonight's presentation is the Uni University of Vermont Humanities Center. It's kind of appropriate that it's UVM sponsoring tonight, right? Now? Right. Yeah. So, our presenter for the. the Title here is Emily Dickinson, Poet of New England. So for the local poets in the audience, that appellation's already taken, you have to come up with something else. You can't be the poet of New England, but we have Huck Gutman here to do the presentation. Huck is a professor of English Emeritus at the University of Vermont, where he taught courses in 19th century and 20th century American poet, poetry and modern poetry and translation. A, a former chair of the UVM English Department, he has twice taught abroad as a Fulbright Fellow. He has written or edited four books and has been a regular political columnist for major newspapers abroad. He also spent six years in Washington serving as Chief of Staff for Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. We've heard of him. Good thing. <laughs> Would you please join me in welcoming Huck Gutman. I'm glad so, so many of you are here. And let me start off by saying I, I've talked a number of times in libraries. I think one of the great institutions in America, and especially in Vermont, are our libraries. And I'm not saying that just because I'm speaking in the library and being sponsored by a library. Libraries are maybe the only wonderful socialist institution we have. Don't, don't blanch at socialists. You go to the library and you get what you want. All you have to do is bring it back. You don't have to pay for it. You pay for it with taxes and stuff. Uh, libraries are welcoming to people. I don't know how many of you come to the library often. I go to the library in Burlington, the Fletcher Free Library, two or three times a week. Every single computer terminal is taken. That is, we live in a society where People more and more need to be online, and lots of people don't have access to being online, and they can find it in the library, they can find books in libraries, they can find magazines in libraries, they can go to cultural events in libraries, and it's open, they're open to everyone. And I, I think we sometimes don't realize how extraordinary it is that we have a system of public libraries all throughout the country, and especially in Vermont. So I, I wanted to start by saying that. I, the second thing I want to say is, um, I had originally thought I'd talk about Emily Dickinson as a New England poet. Uh, she says in one of her poems that begins the Robin's My Criterion for Tune, she says, uh, I sing like the queen, uh, like the queen, I sing provincially. I mean, she, she's proud of her New England roots. But instead of talking about her as a New England poet, I thought I'd just talk about her as an extraordinary poet. I, I think of her as one of the two or three greatest 
of American poets. I, I really am in love with Walt Whitman and, I do, and, and with William Carlos Williams. Um, she's a great, great poet. I thought we would perhaps uh, just go through her poetry and, and get a sense of how she does things and why she's such a great poet. Now, here's, um, she, she engaged in a long correspondence with a man named Thomas Wentworth uh, Higginson, and uh, he asked for a photo of her. I'm gonna show you a photo, actually. I'm gonna show you two. And she said, I love this. She said that she wrote great letters. Nobody in, in the whole history of, of the English language wrote letters as good as her, except maybe John Keats. You all know about John Keats, who says, eh, not as good as Keats. But Keats said, there, I believe in nothing but the holiness of the heart's I believe in nothing but the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of the imagination. Just pinned that off in a letter. And she has these great letters, and in one of them, when Higginson who worked for a magazine uh, after a photograph, she said, could you believe me without, I have no portrait now, but I'm small like the wren, and my hair is bold like the chestnut burr, that is reddish brownish, you all know about chestnuts and my eyes like the sherry in the glass that the guest leaves with that, with this do just as well. Well, we do have a picture of her. That's the famous picture of her, which is on the cover of your thing. And some pretty remarkable scholarship unearthed another picture of her only about 10 years ago. So for, for, for 150 years, this is the only picture we had. But here's the other picture. She's this figure right here. Uh, older. As you see, she was not, she wasn't the greatest looking person, I suppose. And she was, as stories have it, she was kind of a recluse, right? She, she didn't leave her house and garden for years. In fact, she often wouldn't leave her room when, when a good friend of hers went overseas and came back. He had to speak to her through a closed door. She was in the room and he was outside. Uh, I guess if we wanted to diagnose her, we would call her agoraphobic, afraid of going out in public. That seems to me small stuff. I, I mean, really, I mention that because most of you may have heard that. Did most of you hear that she's a recluse, right? Yes. Yes. No, we can't hide it, but that, that's not what she's about. So um, here is a poem of hers. Who was the which, person on the left? Oh, that's a, a woman named Kate Scott Turner, and I know nothing about her. <laughs> but it's a good question. <laughs> so it's a very short, light poem of hers, and, and I, I don't think anybody writes about it or talks about it except for me. I really love the poem. It's called We Introduce Ourselves. And I don't believe in mystifying you. You should all have a copy of her poems in front of you. So if you think I'm pulling a fast one on you, uh, you, you can say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about this? And, um, the truth is when we talk about poems, they often skip over lines because they don't understand them very well or it doesn't fit in their interpretation. And you're allowed to do that. You can always catch out people. They say, oh, 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 it goes without saying. Like there'll be a stanza about the grass being too tall that I don't, in one of these poems, I don't really understand. I puzzled and puzzled and puzzled over it. And, uh, if we could understand poems completely, we wouldn't really need them, right? We, we could walk along with them. But we go back to them because they keep speaking to us and keep saying more and, and are deeper. And this is a wonderful example of that. This is a very, very short poem. Uh, it's, as you see, five lines. Um, and it, it, it's really easy, it seems. We introduce ourselves to planets and the flowers, but with ourselves have etiquettes, embarrassments, and awes. And I'd like to look at that for just a moment, and then we'll go on to some other poems. But we know what she means by etiquettes. When we meet people, we say, how are you? We shake hands, you know, we, we, we make sure we're dressed. Uh, we, if we're men, not so much today, not me. We shave, you know, we have all sorts of procedures whereby we relate to one another, so we have etiquettes. And we have embarrassments, we all know that. There are moments when we encounter another people, and we know when they talk about certain things, or we're a little embarrassed. And sometimes, you know, they, they, they say there's another person, and they're in front of me, and we're all <coughs> by it. I, I think it's a very wonderful poem. But it 
took me a number of years to realize that I was reading it too quickly, and I think we don't want to read poems too quickly. There's this funny word, ourselves. And I think she's not just talking as we first may think, or as I first thought when I read it, about our relation to other people. It's also, the poem works on two levels, right? This is how we relate to other people, the etiquettes, embarrassments, and all this. But it's also the way we relate me, myself, right? Our own selves. And even with ourselves, we have to the rules by which we function. And we have embarrassments, and at times we stand before ourselves and what we feel and are just astonished and astounded. So and this is an indication, it seems to me, of a very short poem which says a lot to us, or can say a lot to us, about not only how we relate and have trouble relating to other people, but how we sometimes have trouble relating to ourselves. Because it's easy to talk to the universe, to planets, and to flowers. It's, Although we'll get a poem where it's not so easy to talk to flowers in here. But it, it's really hard to deal with other people and with our own selves. So uh, that would be our, my start with Dickinson. And we will find again and again, not that she's trying, you know, she's not writing for high school classes. She's not writing for people in libraries. She wrote 1776 poems. She wrote them out by hand. She sewed them together in little booklets and stuck them in a drawer and published 12 in her lifetime. Right? She, she's not trying to blow us away. She was writing, well, we'll come to this at the end. She was writing poems because that's what she did. And, and the kind of depth of the ourselves here, that, that it makes the poem work on two different levels. They can be about our relations to other people or our relations with our own self is something we'll encounter again and again. Now, here's a picture of the house that she lived in in Amherst, Massachusetts. Here's a contemporaneous uh, etching or engraving. Uh, she wrote the poems we'll be reading about 1860. Here's a more modern picture of it. And here's a picture of her room, her bedroom, as it's been reconstructed. And here's her room with her bed. And the first poem we're going to read is about waking up in bed. And I'm like this, which are shades. There are going to be curtains. And the curtains open a little bit. And she looks out the curtain. I mean, you couldn't have a poem on a smaller subject. Then I woke up in the morning, and I opened my eyes, and I could see out a little bit of the curtain. That's the whole poem, right? And, and that's what we're going to encounter in this next poem called The Angle of a Landscape. She's lying in bed and, and waking up and looking out. And, and the word kasare, she says, like a Venetian, which we're going to get here, it's a trope for an assassin. Venice was noted for breathing assassins for a, a reason I don't understand. So she says, the angle of a landscape that every time I wake, right, she's waking up in bed, between my curtain and the wall, upon an ample crack. You all understand that, right? She's looking out her window, and she's got a little crack between the wall and the curtain, and what does she see? And then she's going to tell us. And, and, and it costs her when she awakes from the world of sleep into the world of being awake. Well, look what's there. It's, 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 it's jumping on me. It costs my open eyes just a bough of apples. So there's an apple tree out her window held slanting in the sky. The pattern of a chimney, you all know that, right? I mean, if you have a chimney across the street from your house or in your bedroom, you, you look at the pattern of bricks on it, yeah, every morning she sees that. Just the pattern of a chimney, the forehead of a hill, that's the, we call it sometimes, I mean, it's metaphorical, right? The brow of a hill. Sometimes a vein's forefinger, you all know what she's talking about there? It's a church steeple, and sometimes there is a, a weather vane that comes into view, right? Sometimes there's a vane's forefinger, but that's occasional. Depends which way the wind is blowing. Nobody has any trouble with the poem that, that far, right? Then she says, it doesn't get much harder. The seasons shift my picture. Upon my emerald bow, I wait to find no emeralds. So what's happened? Leaves. The leaves are fall. The, the green leaves have fallen off the trees. It's, it's fall. And then it becomes winter, and there's snow on the branches, right? 
than diamonds, which the snow from polar caskets fetched me. That's it. That's the poem. And I look out my window, and this is what I see. Sometimes the seasons change, and sometimes things stay the same. The chimney and the hill and just the steeple's finger, that's the steeple itself, not the main on top of it, these never stir at all. And, and what we have here, I mean, it seems like nothing, but it's a meditation on what we encounter, both transitoriness and time and change, and things that endure and are there for us all the time. That's what she says when she wakes up. Waking up and looking out the little angle of the window, that's enough for her to write about the large things that we encounter in the world, which are a world of mutation. Yeah, we could talk like English majors, a world of mutation and temporal change and a world of stasis and eternal being. But she just talks about her bedroom. So let's look at another one. This is a, a good poem for us right now. Uh, I think it's mostly a November poem, but it can also be uh, a Vermont April poem, right? you know, like today. The sky is low, the clouds are mean, a traveling flake of snow across a barn or through a rut debates if it will go. A narrow wind complains all day how someone treated him. Nature, like us, is sometimes caught without her diadem. This is really, this is, I cited, before somebody wanted a sound test, I cited Wordsworth and said, you know, my heart leaps up when I yell the rainbow in the sky. He thought nature could save us. And here's Emily Dickinson telling us what we all know which is the world isn't like calendars all the time. Sometimes it's just kind of gray and grubby with a little bit of snow blowing it. It doesn't have a diadem. It doesn't have a crown. It's just an ordinary late spring day when we think it should be spring, but it's not, or early winter day in November. So it's, again, a poem of just observing what is around her with great clarity. Here's another poem of great clarity. It's called, There's Been a Death in the Opposite House. I'm starting with poems I think are not real hard. I, 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 I mean, I'm not sure any of them are easy, and I'm not sure the ones that I think are hard are all that hard, but let's look at this one. There's been a death in the opposite house. So across the street, somebody's died, right? And what we're going to encounter is somebody who is looking with great acuteness and great perception at what's going on, saying, that, hey, what, what does it look like that somebody dies in a house across the street? And, and it's going to end up, it, it's uh, just like the news in just a country town, that's the way things look, right? There's been a death in the opposite house as lately as today, it happened last night. I know it by the numb look such houses have all day. And, and I should mention here that uh, her great contemporary, writing literally at the same time, Walt Whitman reinvented poetry. He wrote something called free verse. He wrote lines that go on and on and on and on, and sometimes two lines and sometimes three lines before the line is finished. He was going to blow through everything and, and, and reinvent language. Emily Dickinson was going to use language in the form she encountered it in poetry, which was in church, in hymns. So there's a very simple metrical form known as hymn meter or hymn <coughs> meter or ballad meter. And it has alternating iambic pentameter, iambic tetrameter and iambic trimeter, which means four, so four feet of four beats with eight syllables and then three beats with six syllables. And, and she's going to use that in most of her poems. I, one of the astonishing things about Emily Dickinson is she uses one of the simplest and most familiar forms of writing poetry. And yet she blows right through it in her poems, uh, in poem after poem. So everything we're going to read from now on, or almost everything, is going to be in these quatrains, these four line stanzas, alternating uh, tetrameter and trimeter. I know it by the numb look such houses have all the way, right? Somebody's just died and the house looks kind of numb. It's you know, a lot of activity. Somebody died there last night. The neighbors rustle in and out 
the doctor drives away. We know where the doctor drove, drove away, right? The person's dead. A window opens like a pod, abrupt, mechanically. I don't know why it's like a pod, but you can ask me about that, but I don't know. But, but the window opens mechanically. Somebody's airing out the room, and yet it's not like ordinary, ah, I think I'll open the window. It's, it's you know, it's abruptly, and, 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 and uh, it's mechanically. We're going to get another poem about dying, which we'll talk about the feet mechanical, go <laughs> round the ground, or air, or ought. I mean, things are kind of mechanical, kind of automatic when someone dies, rather than organic and free form. Somebody flings a mattress out. You go to Why is that? They died on it. I got rid of that mattress. The children hurry by. They wonder if it, not the person anymore, it's a thing, right? It's a girl. If it died on that, I used to when a boy. Well, he didn't say she was never a boy, but you know, in a poem, you can write what you want to write. And so she'll just adopt the voice here of, of when I was a boy. Does everybody follow this one so far? It's not hard. Right? The minister goes stiffly in as all the house were his. And he owned all the mourners now and little boys besides. I love this stanza. It's very funny. You shouldn't have to explain jokes, but you know, the ministers are kind of august and stiff. Pardon me if anybody's a minister, but you know, it's, it's you know, they're, they're very serious people. I, 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 but it's like, ah! Somebody died here. I'm taking command, right? As if the house were his. I'm in charge here. And he owned all the mourners now. I'm going to tell him what to do and how to deal with this. And, and you kids joking about the mask and mattress. Shh, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's you, she's talking about the minister, but she's also making fun of the minister. And that's a little bit of a, of a joke, even though it's hard to explain humor and so on. Not good at it. And then the milliner, right? They're gonna fit out the, let's assume it's a man, the, the suit that the man will be married, buried in, or if it's a woman, the dress she'll be buried in. And the man of the appalling trade, oh, what a pun, right? Appall is, is a funeral thing. The man of the appall, the undertaker has come, right? And the man of the appalling trade to take the measure of the house. Oh, this poem is so funny, right? I mean, he's going to measure how big the coffin should be, but he's also saying, hmm, I wonder how much I can charge these people for this funeral, right? <laughs> to take the measure of the house. And then she says, there'll be that dark parade, right? That's what a funeral procession is. It's, it's like a parade of tassels, you know, the black tassels on the hearse, and of coaches soon. It's easy as a sign, the intuition of the news, in just a country town. It's an extraordinarily close look at what a funeral looks like in 19th century, mid 19th century Vermont, or what it looks like when death comes. We know it doesn't look like that now. Now people die in hospitals, right? Now, I, I, I mean, some of it's the same, but so much of it is different. This is just what happens. It's part of the routine of the town. It just happens and she's going to show it to us. Now, we're going to turn to harder poems now, harder in the sense that, that they too will look at very specific things, but we'll have to think more. And this is one of my very favorite poems of hers. It's called I Tie My Hat, I Crease My Shawl. Can you borrow your, your scarf for a minute? Turn your scarf, yeah. She, I'll give it back, I promise. And so she's got a hat on, right? And a, and a shawl. I tie my hat, or I crease my shawl. So she's adjusting that life's little, life's little beauties do precisely, carefully. As the very least were infinite to me. And if we're reading carefully, the thing about poems is it's not like you have to read them like you're in fifth grade and raise your hand and say, teacher, I know what's going on. I know what the meaning is. It's, it's it. Sometimes we want to look very closely and carefully at the world and at language, or it slips right by us. 
And this poem, we want to do exactly what she said. Why? We want to be a little infinitely careful. Why is she being so infinitely careful about tying her hat and creasing her shawl? I tie my hat, I crease my shawl, life's little duties do precisely. I do them very precisely, as the very least were infinite to me. Why is she taking such care with such little things? And she goes on to say, I put new blossoms in the glass. Well, we know what's going on there, right? Nobody has any problem with that. I went out and cut some flowers in the garden and put new blossoms in the vase and throw the old away. I push a petal from my gown that anchored there. What's happening there? Well, she's brought in the new flowers. She's thrown out the old flowers. Some of you have thrown out old flowers, right? A petal falls off. One gets on her dress, she pushes it off. She's just paying attention. She's taking infinite care with all of this. And, and push a petal from my gown that anchored there. I weigh, I don't need it anymore. I weigh, I weigh the time till 6 o'clock. I weigh the time twill be till six o'clock. I have so much to do. We know what that means too, right? I mean, it's, it's she's not being trite. She, but we have a saying about that that's in common parlance, right? Time is heavy on our hands. She's weighing time because she has so much to do. I have to tie my hat, I have to grease my shawl, I have to put the flowers in the glass, I have to set the table, I have to make dinner, right? But then the poem really surprises us. Because she says, and yet existence, somewhere back, stopped, struck my, t struck my ticking through. Uh, my life stopped. I'm being precise about everything because my life stopped. What does that mean, she stopped? And, and she's going to tell us. It's a really very, very difficult and painful poem. I, mean, I, I love it, even though it's painful. She's taking such care because her life somehow stopped. And she says, you know, my life ended at some point in the past. We cannot put ourselves away as a completed man or woman. Oh. Oh. Even poets could say man or woman. They don't always have to assume that only one pronoun will work, right? As a completed man or woman, when the errand's done, we came to flesh upon. So something happened that she was born for, and it, or, or, or she was born for something, and something happened, and she ain't going to get it. Is it love? Is it fulfillment as a poet? Is it, I don't know. The, the, the poem doesn't tell us. It just says, something stopped. And, and my heart, in a sense, stopped ticking, right? Stop my ticking. It struck my ticking through. Are you following this, right? I mean, life has stopped, and she has to keep going. Of course she takes great care, because we, we there may be, and she says, ah, oh, she's such a good poet. There may be miles on miles of not, right? I said before, you know, that time weighs heavy on our hands. That's a little trite, but this is really, there may be miles of nothingness I have to go through, but not nothingness is not like naught, like zeros, right? There may be miles on miles of naught. I mean, of emptiness is all the stretches before me. I, I was quoting before we started, somebody asked me about time. I was quoting Marvell. He says, any hunger hole before us lie deserts of vast eternity, right? It's empty out there. And then she says, if that's not enough, miles and miles and not of action sicker far, she says. It's, it's bad enough that it's all empty in front of me, but I have to keep going. And keep cutting flowers and putting them in the vase and tying my hat, creasing my shoulder and looking like, well, oh, I'm okay. Right? So, of action sicker far, to simulate is stinging work. If we're... Yeah. Inquiring, we say, well, 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 why does she have to simulate? Which means pretend, right? Or cover up, or act like, instead of acting what you really are. So why does she have to do this? And she tells us, so the poem doesn't hold a lot back, even though it's hard, to simulate is stinging work to cover what we are. 
I, I, I know what simulate means, she says. It's covering up what we really are. We pretend to be something else to cover what we are from science and from surgery, right? And, and these are, are kind of symbols. Science is about knowing things, and surgery is about you know, make, curing people and making them better. To cover what we fought, are from science and from surgery, and she says, to telescopic eyes to bear on us unshaded. Well, you take a telescope and you try to look at something that is extraordinarily powerful, like the sun, and you will be blinded. So she doesn't want her friends. She lived in the house she was born, and she lived in with her mother and her father and her sister, Lavinia, and her brother got married and built a house next door. His name was Austin. So she don't want all these people to see how empty her life is, all these miles and miles and not, how her ticking is done. She wants to protect them from knowing too much or wanting to help them to bear on us unshaded for their sake, not for ours. She's not hiding so that she can go around saying, well, oh, nobody needs to ought to know what I am. She's hiding because she wants to protect them. Does all this make sense to you? I mean, I think that's what she's telling us. Yes, but I want to know why it says T-O-O. -O. Also, the, the eyes are also? This one? Yes. The, their eyes are too telescopic to bear on us unshaded. So if, if they weren't so telescopic, they could see <coughs> okay. the devastation. Right. But because they're telescopic, and they will will magnify Got the it. brightness of the, of the explosion. She's going to talk about an explosion in a moment. Let's say it's like a bomb, right? And if they could see it through a telescope, they would be blinded. And it would start them. I think start there probably means startle. We could tremble. We, ourselves, who have had this inner devastation, we could tremble like these other people would if they could only see what was happening. But since we got a bomb, and then I, I used to not like this, and now I think it's just brilliant. And they hold it in our bosom, right? It's in the past, but it's also in the present. The, the reverberations of that inner explosion that exploded everything that life was about, the, the errand we came to flesh upon, it keeps on going. It is calm. The aftermath of a bomb is, in some sense, emptiness and calmness, <laughs> even though the explosion keeps happening. And then comes the end of the poem, and then, this is why I like the poem so much. She says, therefore we do life's duties. Remember how it started? I, I won't borrow your stuff again. I tie my hat, I grease my shawl, life's little duties too. I put new blossoms in the glass and throw the old away. I brush a petal from my back. Gown that anchored there. I wait the time to be till six o'clock. I do all these little things, even though life is over. Therefore, we do life's labor, though life's reward be done with scrupulous exactness to hold our senses on. And she said that the way we get through pain is by noticing and paying attention. The way we get through a life in which there is ruin inside us is to pay attention to everything. That's what the poem tells us. I don't know if she's right. I mean, there's this problem with poems that some people, myself included, try to think poems give us the answers to the problems of our lives. I don't know if they do. I don't know if she's right about this. But it certainly lies behind the writing of her poems. She is going to be scrupulously exact as in this line, scrupulously exact in noticing what is going on within her. Now, we're going to read two poems here. I'm going fast because I want to go through a bunch of poems because she, she's such a good poem. I mean, all of these poems are just so good, right? This is a springtime poem, right? Do some of you know T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland? It begins April is the cruelest month. month. Why is April the cruelest month? Can anybody answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why is that bad? Oh, no. No. That's it. That's a pretty good answer. This is not a brother poem, but that's a good answer. That, I like that. Anybody else? What was the answer? 
The answer is because April is her brother's birthday and he oh. bothers her. That's a good answer. False, false optimism. I would like to agree with that, but I'm not sure it's true. Because in this poem, as we're going to see, and that's not a bad answer either, in this poem, you know, the bees come back and the daffodils bloom and the grass grows. It's not false. It, well, the, the, the world is renewed, you life, know? Life, life blossoms and comes alive, and you can't go with it. There you go. I think that's the heart of this poem. I, I think you're right. That there is a false optimism about spring, but it's related to the fact that the world is renewed and we are maybe not. And that's going to be the wellspring of this poem, right? So I dreaded that first Robin so, but I couldn't stand it. He was coming, but I guess I've got the control of things now. But he is mastered now. I'm, I, you know, she's so good with words, right? Pardon me. She's not accustomed to the She's not quite comfortable with I'm so accustomed to him grown. He hurts a little, though. And he hurts because. The robin is coming back. Have you all of you noticed the robins have come back? Mm -hmm. they, they never go away in Vermont in the winter anymore, but they somehow seem to appear more and eat, eat crab apples, you know, that are shriveled on trees and stuff. Have you noticed that? No? Okay. And, and soon they'll have worms because the ground is unfreezing. So she's a little used to the robin, although he hurts her. I thought if I could only live till that first shout got by. Beep, beep. It becomes a shout. <coughs> and this line, I don't know where she came up with this line. I mean, this is like out of the surrealist poem of the 1930s. <laughs> Not all the pianos in the woods have power to mangle me. We know exactly what she's talking about. Dang, dang, dang! Right? And, and that's the way this, the first sounds of birds in the spring, which we're supposed to love, right? The nature that is, that is not caught without its diet. I, but but she hates the sound and hates the sound and here's here's a I, I dare not meet the daffodils for fear their yellow gown would pierce me with a fashion so foreign to my own. What? Yellow daffodils. I know a restaurant for lunch today they had yellow daffodils. It's so cheery. Yellow is so cheery. That is a fashion so foreign to her own, right? And it would pierce her. It's almost like being crucified. I dare not meet the daffodils for fear their yellow gown would pierce me with a fashion so far into my own. And here's the one I don't quite understand. I'm going to rush through it. And I can explain. I wish the grass would hurry so when it was time to see he'd be too tall the tallest. I think she's talking about the grass would grow so tall and see the little Emily down here, but I don't know. I wish the grass would hurry so when it was time to see he'd be too tall the tallest one could stretch to look at me. I, I could be hidden. Yes? I noticed in the last the last set of four lines on the top. Yeah. The second sentence and the fourth sentence uh, were just a little work rhyme. Oh, her, her, her. Uh, like th that was. See, Gavin and Owen are. Owen and Owen. Yeah, it's called a slant rhyme. It, it kind of almost rhymes, but doesn't rhyme. This will rhyme exactly C and me, right? Um, so she's going to use a lot of slight lines. And, and the lines in him meter rhyme A, B, A, B. The first and third lines rhyme, and the second and fourth lines rhyme. And, and so the, she's very good at using rhymes and not being so exact that there'll be sing song. Pardon me, sir. And during the time she was writing, the ability to rhyme was, was considered to be almost indispensable. Good question. Yes and no. I mean, Shakespeare wrote all those plays and they did the rhyme. They, they, they had metrical stanchion. He wrote all those sonnets and they did rhyme. Yeah, I think mostly poets thought that poems should rhyme. And I still think today most people, when they sit, sit down to write a poem, think they ought to write something in rhyme. I think the movement towards lines that didn't scan easily, that didn't have metrical patterns and, and didn't have rhymes, really begins with Walt Whitman, her contemporary. So people are already doing different things. 
but she's working with the older model, and yet, as you pointed out, Gown and own are slant runs. She's, she's using the old pattern, but shifting it a little bit. And, and th there's something about her that is always exploring and moving forward. So let's, you remember, if we got the yellow daffodils, we got the green grass, she can't stand it all. I could not bear that bees should come. I wish they'd stay away in those dim countries where they go. What word had they for me? The bees are back. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. And this woman is going crazy because the animals are coming back. In the winter, there is a very powerful silence. And if this is a woman who was a recluse, that may have had an appeal for her, and suddenly it's spring, and you don't get one robin, you get them all across the yard, and they make a huge Absolutely, of absolutely. I, I, and I wouldn't go too much on her being a recluse, because we can fall into that. But what you're saying, which is winter, I mean, that's what Elliot says at the beginning of the wasteland, which is I don't kind of like this. Winter was nice, we were kind of quiet. Mm -hmm. There's snow over everything, and nothing was growing. You couldn't have to think about social things. because the snow was the door. You couldn't get out anyway. It but she stupid. can't stand all of this. Starting again. And and I, I go with you in, in finding that life begins again, and she doesn't want to respond, or that the world is full of busyness, and she wants her silence. I think they're not so far apart. And, and then she says, they're here, though. They're here, though. Not a creature failed. They all came back. The daffodils, the robins, the bees, the grass, everything came back. They're here, though. Not a creature failed. No blossom stayed away in gentle deference to me, the queen of Calvary. You know the queen of Calvary is? It's Mary, mother of God, whose grief and mourning are beyond compare. And everything comes back and is renewed except for me. I'm in mourning. I want my silence and my peacefulness and you know my my empty devastation. Each one salutes me as he goes. And then she turns into a kind of a child here, and I my childish plumes lift in bereaved acknowledgement of their unthinking drums. She's bereaved. She's married. She's lost everything. She lives with emptiness, and fullness is coming back to the world. Spring is coming back to the world. And they, the robins don't think, and the bees don't think, and the daffodils don't think that we think, and we know what we've lost. And we have to go through spring, and yes, it's a really hard time. So another bird bug. I love her bird bones. <laughs> also not a robin. A bird came down the walk. Right? You've got to pay attention to this. At, at the beginning, it sounds like a children's book. A bird came down the walk. He did not know I saw. He bit an angle worm and had an ate the fellow. Raw. <laughs> so so there's a very great anthropologist named Claude Levi-Strauss. He thought uh, you could organize almost a, all human Tales in almost all human culture along uh, the, the dichotomy of law and crime, uh, either civilized or natural. And this bird lives in a world in the first stanza that is not your world and my world, I don't think. I mean, spring is here, and not many people go out and eat raw worms. But this bird eats raw worms, and in the next stanza, you know, he drinks a dew from a convenient grass. Not how I get. I, I drink glass out of a water, uh, 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 out of a glass, water out of a glass or a little bottle, right? He, he can sip dew and then <coughs> hop sidewise to the wall to let a beetle pass. There's a difference in scale between the robin and us. All of these beginning lines are about how the robin lives in a different world than she does. Okay, I've overrun, maybe. Except, look what happens. He glanced with rapid eyes and hurried all around. They looked like frightened bees, I thought. But why do his eyes look frightened? They look so much. They, they do. Bird's eyes are always moving around. I, I once knew an engineer at UVL who studied ocular vision. And, and bird's eyes, birds only can see a little bit of 
of what we can see, that I'm peripheral vision, so their eyes move all the time so they can scan everything. But why else do they look like frightened beads? They look like beads because they're round like beads. Bird is scared because there's this great big thing called Emily Dickinson, <laughs> right? Standing there, and he's saying, whoa! And so they, he stirred his velvet head like one in danger. He is in danger. There's this big human being next to him. Not a cat, but he doesn't know that. Like one in danger. And, and, and the like one in danger can be read either way. It can be, right? We'll go back and think, he stirred his he velvet head like one in danger. Or it can be, I, as if I am in danger, because she's going to be in danger in this poem, cautious offered him a crumb. So, you know, she got a little piece of roll or cake or something. Say, here, birdie, birdie. I, you know. so, it's a little odd. You know, you don't actually feed crumbs to robins. They, they don't eat crumbs. They eat worms. But anyway, she tries to offer him a worm. And, and this is so gorgeous. And yet it's terrifying on another level. And he unrolled his feathers and rode him softer home if oars divide the ocean to silver for a scene, or butterflies off banks of noon leap plashless as they swim. I mean, it sounds gorgeous, right? He unrolls his feathers and rode him softer home than oars divide the ocean to silver for a scene. Now, that, that sounds gorgeous, but what's happening there? It's not hard. The bird is leaving. How's the bird getting away? Flying. So the bird is flying away. And, and it's important to notice what she just noticed, that it's flying. He, he, he's rolling. I mean, you know, the, it, we, we have a metaphor here. The movement of the, of the wings is like oars rowing, you know, a boat, and rowed him softer home than oars divide the ocean, except it's too silver for sea. When the bird rose in the air, it's not like there are marks. Have you all rowed boats or paddled canoes? You leave little marks in the water, right? Now eventually they're gone, but you leave them there. And, and they're not, there's no mark. This bird is, I would say, at one with the air. Just like butterflies. Now there's simile here, right? Butterflies who can, in the middle of the day, off banks of noon, now they're just banks of flowers, but also just noontime, leap, and there's not even a splash. You say leap into the air. And what do we have at the end of the poem? We have the bird has flown off, and Emily Dickinson is still there with the crumb anchored firmly to the ground, right? There's a tremendous difference between the human world, which doesn't eat worms, and doesn't drink dew, and doesn't uh, step aside to let beetles pass. And especially, doesn't make friends with the natural world so easily. And, 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 and the bird, which just flies off into its own place. I think this is a, an anti-romantic capital R poem. This is a poem that's very opposite to all those people who want to say, Oh, yeah, we can get close to nature, and we can be friends with nature, and we can learn from nature. She's saying, no, wait a minute. You approach nature, and it flies away. Yes? Sorry to interrupt you. That brings, up, quite a, right. that brings up an important point from a Midwesterner's perspective. What strikes you about Emily Dickinson is, is her sort of Calvinist environment. So isn't a lot of these poems commentary or sort of a transformational figure in Calvinism? Good question. I, I, I don't quite have an answer for you. I think she comes from a, a very uh, severe Protestant background, but she doesn't understand religion, she tells us. And, and her poems about religion are, are not satisfying to those who believe in God, even in... in but that's in, what this is, no? Go ahead. Isn't this about religion and humans and the words she capitalizes and some she doesn't? And I, just like I, I, I'm not trying to no, get just, myself out of a hole. Just like <laughs> I, 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 I would caution not to think too much about 
about her being a recluse. I would not pay too much attention to capitalization. It's a, a little erratic in her. It was not regularized until the 18th century, and she's living in a rural area in the 19th century. So I, I'm not sure I would overstate. Doesn't mean you shouldn't refer to it, but I, um, no, I think, I think that's a step beyond. And I wouldn't say no. Is she divorced from the world that God has created, that he saw and felt was good, capital H, D, Calvin Scott? Yeah, except, you know, the poem, it seems to me, works before we get to the religious on her in the natural world. And that's why I'm presenting it to you. If your concerns, and that's the thing about poems, if your concerns are, if you're really concerned about what religion means in the world, what God means in the world, then of course you will read this as a, as a disjunction between the human and the divine. And I wouldn't argue at all. All I'm saying is that there is this disjunction between her and the world of the bird, whether the world of the bird is nature or God's world. I'm up, up for all of that. Is that all right? I mean, Beautiful. You know, it's, it's, it's a poem about a divorce between two different spheres. And hers is the human sphere, and it's, um, and it's pretty, it's, you know, it, it seems like a cute poem at the beginning. Where it came down the walk, even that poem, so I did it. And it sounds like a, like a nursery rhyme, and it's the opposite of one. Well, nursery rhymes aren't all so wonderful, right? <laughs> Humpty Dumpty sat in a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. That's one of my favorite ones. Oh, my God. <laughs> when things fall apart, they stay apart. <laughs> right? Okay. Now, here are two poems about death and dying. And because I want to go through them a little bit quickly, and then I would otherwise... I taken the liberty of, before we read each of the two poems, pointing out the funeral imagery in them. So you know, I felt the funeral in my brain. She's going to say, I had mourners to and fro, right? Mourners are funerals. And, and it's a poem. I felt the funeral in my brain. Uh, I, I, a service like a drum kept beating, beating. She's going to say, so there's drums, you know, drum roll at the funeral. And, uh, I, and then I heard them lift a box, which would be the coffin, and lead boots, it's the heaviness. She'll say in the next poem, we're going to read this is the hour of lead. It's a heavy time, but also lead in the 19th century is used to lie the coffins so that the bodily fluids wouldn't leak out and insects couldn't get in. I don't know. And then she's going to talk about the church bell tolling, and then she's going to talk about the plank on which the coffin rests about the grave people in the funerals, perhaps. And then finally the coffin is lowered into the grave. That's going to be the imagery of going to a funeral. Uh, everybody sees it. You'll see it in the poem. I, I'm not trying to pull a fast one on, on you here. And I felt a funeral in my brain. So this is an internalized funeral as she's looking at it externally. Maybe it's not about a funeral at all. Maybe it's about loss. Maybe it's about the onset of a, of a horrendous headache. I don't know, but I felt a funeral in my brain. Like all the imagery is out of funerals. And mourners to and fro kept treading, treading, till it seemed my sense was breaking, that sense was breaking through. I want like you to pay attention to that line. We're going to come back to that line. Because I think it can be read two ways, right? Oh my God, the person is really dead. Sense is breaking through. Or, as we will discover at the end of the poem, maybe we drop beneath our being sensible and into a kind of madness and irrationality. Could be either one, but mostly it seems like that sense was breaking through. And, and when everybody was sitting down in the pews at the funeral, and when they all were seated, a service like a drum kept beating, beating, till I felt my mind was going numb, right? So we got these bam, bam, right, of treading, treading, beating, beating, and, and oh, I can't stand it anymore. And there's this kind of numbness that surrounds her. It's just too much sadness. And then I heard them lift a box, I suggested before that's a coffin, and creak. So instead of the drumming and the marching in, now they're 
going to be careful. I can creak across my soul with those same boots of lead again. And I, I think that probably becomes a problem at this time. Then space began to toll, right? It's the bell ringing. Bang! Bang! Then space began to, to toll as all the heavens were a bell and being but an ear. I mean, there's nothing in the world except the bell and, and being. And it's taking it all in passively. It's just taking it all in. Everything is noise. That's what you were suggesting before about spring. Everything is noise, and I just want it to be quiet. And, 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 and she's wrecked by it. Just as when the bell, bang, bang, wrecks silence, she's wrecked too. And I am silence, some strange race wrecked, solitary here. By the funeral she feels in her brain. I don't know. I mean, I really don't know if this is the experience of a funeral or if this is using funeral imagery to express her sense of loss and grief, right? That, that loss, which a funeral is, a, is a, an example of. I, I just don't know. It could be both. And, and then she says, and this is where Emily Dickinson, to me, is beyond other poets. And then a plank in reason broke. Right? Coffins on, on top of a plank of the grave, and then a coffin's lowered in the grave, although in this case it breaks. And then a plank in reason broke, and I dropped down and down and hit a world and every plunge had finished going then. And it doesn't end. She's still dropping. Now, there, there's a Many years ago, I read a, a psychoanalytic study of Emily Dickinson, which I now think is entirely wrong. <laughs> but it taught me one great thing about Emily Dickinson, which I think was entirely right, which is that there are aspects of our minds, of, of, of what goes on in our hearts, not only in our minds, our hearts too, that there are aspects of us that are, go almost beyond words, and we just can't put them in words. I, uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who wrote uh, a couple years after Dickinson died, said at the end of the sonnet, oh, mine, mine has mountains, cliffs of all frightful may, call them cheap may he who ne'er hung there. We, we all have mountains inside us, and we can fall into depths of despair and despond and depression and sadness. And, and, and the world can be incomprehensible. And at the end of this poem, Emily Dickinson is falling into something, and the poem doesn't go where words can't follow, right? She says, and then the plank in reason broke, and I dropped down and down and hit a world at every plunge and finished knowing then. And she's still falling. Right? I wrote in the context of something else, or actually of a, a poet who, who writes, about experiences that are, seem to be beyond words. He's writing about concentration camps. I wrote recently on this list of poems. I said that of the last words of, of uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein in a book of philosophy, he wrote, he says, well, but man sprechen kann, darüber muss man schweigen. Where well, we cannot speak, we must be silent. This poem trails off into a, a, a silence that is profound. As she go, drops beneath reason, right? Underneath reason. Let's go back to that line I said that sense was breaking through. She's going beneath sense. The sense is breaking through in the sense of the, the enormity of the loss, but sense is also breaking through in the sense that she is going in her mind where, where words can't follow. And what this psychoanalyst, who I mentioned before, had to say was that, you know, we don't have anybody else in the whole history of human beings, who has tried to tell us this with as much clarity and precision of what it's like to find everything falling apart as Emily Dickinson, that she's the great explorer of, of the interior of our minds when they're pushed to their limits. And so, I, I mean, that's the way I would read the end of that poem. And, and we have another poem that, that the book I was referring to is called After Great Pain, based on on this next poem, After Great Pain. Again, the imagery is all from funerals, right? I, you notice that in our culture, at least, when people die, 
So we put puts on their fine suits and they, and they, and they walk in in a very cer ceremonious way right? and they're guided to their seats and nobody stands up and goes, ah! And nobody does that. They're all ceremonious. Right? And this is about being ceremonious and stiff. And, and she, time doesn't make any sense. Neither for her who's suffered the loss nor for the, for the person who's died who's no longer in the world of time. It's now in a different world, whether it's a Calvinist world or whether it's just a dead end world. Uh, and, and people are mechanical, right? They, they're automatic. And, and the line will go uh, 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 about walking. Well, we'll get to the line. And, and, and she says everything's grown wooden. I, mean, I think that's a reference probably to the coffin again. A wooden way, regardless of where grown, and quartz contentment like a stone. You know, the quartz contentment. Quartz contentment? Mm -hmm. if, if you wanted to be contented, and I offered you a quartz contentment, cold, crystalline, hard, would you want it? Probably not. A quartz contentment like a stone. A stone is again, maybe, maybe, a reference to the stones that are in cemeteries. This is the hour of lead, she says again, a reference to lead, which is a lighting of coffins, and it's also the heaviness of the hour. And then uh, there's a kind of an end. And, and you'll be prepared for the ending of this poem because it's like the ending of the last poem. I don't have any other poems quite like these two. After great pain, now we like to see in movies, we see that, right? People get shot in the chest, they go, <laughs> And, and, and after great pain, she says, a formal feeling comes. The nerves sit ceremonious, like tombs. The stiff heart questions, was it he, dead person, or me, myself, that bore in yesterday or centuries before? Time doesn't matter anymore. The feet. These are great lines. Everything she writes is great. The feet <laughs> mechanical go round the ground or air or thoughts. I mean, after great pain, we just go through stuff mechanically. Like we saw in that moment, I my hat, I grease my show. And, and look at how she's going round of ground right? or air or ought. We do the things we have to do, that we should do. Right? These are very different things, ground and air and ought. And she yokes them together. A ground or air or ought. And, and, and after great pain, unlike what we would think, that we would be, ah! She says, you know, we kind of grown wooden. We have a quartz-like contentment. Right? A wooden way regardless grown in quartz contentment like a stone. And then this brilliant last quadrant, she says, this is the hour of lead. It's so heavy. Remembered if outlived. If we can go back, if, if we try to remember the pain, if we get through it, as freezing persons recollect the snow, first chill, cold, then still burn, and no letting go. Consciousness ends. Poem can't go any further. So again, it's a poem about and I think it rings true. I mean, we, we don't like to think that. That after pain, we think we'll be in agony forever. No, there's a, we have to keep going and do life's little duties and keep going on. Yes? Could we go back? Sure. A note there. The feet mechanical go round of ground or air or ought. I have a different uh, sure. Interpretation of sure. ought, meaning zero, meaning nothingness. Right. Right. Not that's not fine. ought that's that fine. we have to do. Oh, or nothing. And that's fine. I, I, I don't need to be cute. I, you know, poems can mean a lot of things. The thing about a poem is it can push a lot and go a little bit. So I, I mean, the, the way she's reading this is as, as ought meaning like. Zero. Zero. Yeah, well, it fits perfectly. Is it better than ought? Meaning, you have to? I don't know. Do they both fit? Yeah. yeah. Do you have to do 
You go on because you have to go on. You go on because it's empty and it's all around you. Either one. It, they're not contradictory. And even if they were contradictory, here's the great thing about poems. I really love poems. When I was in college, I thought maybe I should study philosophy. The problem with philosophy, it's really the problem with philosophy, <laughs> is it entirely runs on something on a basic principle of logic called the law of the excluded middle. It's either A or not A. It can't be both. You know, and in poetry, things can be both. <laughs> More than one thing. I mean, I, 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 some of you may be scientists. Some of you, poor physicists have come to that point too, right? Where, where the very basic laws of physics are Light could either be a particle or, a, or, or energy could be a particle or a wave. They don't know. Right? They're not sure. And, and so in, in life, we're sure about a lot of things. But poems refer to the things where we're confused, or not only confused, but where we sense more than one thing going on at a time. So yes, it can be ought, and it can be ought the way you're reading it as zero. Fine. They're not even contradictory. Yes? I'm, I'm responding uh, to these, at least these last two poems, with a feeling of oppressiveness and perhaps an understanding yep. of depression, yep. wh which I don't have a personal understanding of. Um, and, you know, I've got a personal understanding yeah. Well, uh, uh, first I would say uh, the, the, the comment was about that these poems are about an oppressiveness that she finds difficult to understand. I think that's part of the greatness of Emily Dickinson, that is that, that she is willing to address things that most of us would prefer not to address. Just how bad we're going to feel. Mm. Now, did she have her arm cut off? No. Did uh, she have cancer and have to live with it? No. Did she live in dire poverty? No. But she felt great pain. It can happen. And, and she's, I think, to use the words I used in I kind of, the she is not kind of had a crease my shoulder. She's scrupulously exact in reporting that. As to the second part of that, None of us can speak for anybody else. We all live inside our own heads. I think almost all of us at some time feel that, that the life has hurt us badly or that we hover on the edge of depression where nothing means anything. I, I don't think it's so rare. I, I think what she's writing about is a part, not all, a part of human experience. And I, I sometimes, I taught Emily Dickinson for many, many years, and I, I sometimes wondered if I didn't emphasize too much the Emily Dickinson who feels all this great pain and didn't emphasize enough the Emily Dickinson who can be witty and funny about the, the minister who comes stiff to me and is all the house or is, you know, it's pretty funny. Um, I, I think there is something in Dickinson that speaks to the almost unspeakable in our experiences, which have to do with depression, despair, pain, loss. Everybody experiences loss. Everybody. One's parents die. One's friends die. The bicycle we love gets thrown out by our parents. I don't know. But, but, but the experiences of loss and despair we all have to confront them, and we maybe have to answer around them, and she doesn't. So and that's what I really love in her, is this willingness to confront directly what so many of us maybe want to walk away from. Yeah. Um, and, and then I'm going to do one more poem, and then when we're done, you can ask me questions. Can you wait till I go oh, sure. one more? Go ahead. Is that OK? Go ahead. I, 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 go ahead. Oh, this is easy. Two more poems. Okay, I'm going to be quick. I, I love the first half of this poem. This was, a, she apparently was writing about Everson, actually. It was not nearly as good a poet as she was. She liked his essays. She liked his poems. This was a poet 
It is that distills amazing meat that sends from ordinary meanings, right? She's writing about funerals in the town. She's writing about tying her hat. She's writing about, about going to a funeral or using the imagery of funerals, which are very common in 19th century America. From ordinary meanings, this still is amazing sense from ordinary meanings. So the, the, the metaphor is of making perfume, right? Distilling something down to its essence. An adder, that's a pure perfume, so immense from the familiar species that perished by the door. We wonder if it was now ourselves arrested it before. I, I mean, she's not going to use uh, stuff that's far away. And you know, most perfumes are made. You know what perfumes are made from? In her day, in our day, the, the organs of, of wild cats and, and tumors and whales and stuff like that. She said, no, no, I'm just going to use you know, the dead ones outside the house. Or maybe the, 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 the daffodils. Can you make perfume from that? I don't know. But she said she can. So she's going to root herself in her own place. I, I'm writing something which I'll send out to my list. If you signed up the sheet that's gone around, you'll get it about. Uh, by uh, uh, a French poet named Joachim Dubolet, who says, I want to I come home. I want to write about my native sleep. I'm tired of the marble of Rome. I want to write about what's right beside my door. So that's Emily Dickinson. And, and, here's, and, and then we'll come to your question. I want one, one of the long questions is, I mean, she wrote 1776 poems, published 12 in her lifetime, sent some to this magazine editor. Uh, Thomas Wentworth, they didn't see me. He said, ah, you know, he, he said, the quote, your gait is spasmodic. <laughs> you know, your rhythms aren't so good. And she sent another couple to a, actually, this woman liked her poems, to a, 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 one of the major feminist poets of the later 19th century. She published a few of them in an anthology, but mostly she was unpublished. Tied her poems up neatly, put them in a drawer. Did, did she know she was such a good poet? Did she have any idea? I think she did. And so we're going to end up with this poem, uh, which is called The Bronze and Blaze. Uh, and, and it's about, you all know this, right? Because you live in Vermont. I mean, you not all of you, but if you live in Burlington like I do, you never know it if you live in the country. You certainly know it. Uh, it's about the Northern Lights. Uh, how many of you have seen the Northern Lights? Yeah, see, right? You all know, right? Here's some pictures of the Northern Lights. Um, these are really spectacular pictures I got from the web, right? Like you've all seen them, or most of you have seen them. There's a really spectacular one, right? Fantastic. So we know from a letter she wrote that the northern lights appeared above Amherst, Massachusetts on a particular day, and her dog barked, and her father rang the bell in the town and got everybody out of bed so they could see these marvelous Northern Lights in Amherst, Massachusetts. And, and that's why she's going to talk about alarms. That's the bell that her father rang. A bronze and blaze, the North Knight, so adequate it formed, so preconcerted with itself, so distant to alarms. People all see the Northern Lights. They, they seem to have their own logic and they go their own way. And it doesn't matter what we say or do here on Earth, they do their thing. Right? That seems reasonable about the Northern Lights. And then she says, an unconcern so sovereign to universe or me, the Northern Lights just do their thing. And nothing we can do stops them. And no amount of bell ringing by her father can, can slow them down, right? Infects. And she says, I look at those lights, and I get infected by this gigantic show they put on. Infects my simple spirit with paints and majesty. I'd like to be like them. Universal. Playing out before the whole world, right? Women shouldn't be doing it, right? So with Kate's and Majesty, so, and I try to do with them the Northern Lights do. I try to, to put on a show, right? Till I take vaster attitudes and <laughs> strut upon my stem. But she's rooted to the earth, right? She's got a stem. Disdaining men, and a woman poet. And oxygen for arrogance of them. Oh, I could do this, and I could do it really well. I'm as good as Northern Lights. And she says, my splendors are menagerie. Now, you all know what a menagerie is. It's kind of, it's a little show that put, people put on. It's kind of evil. My splendors are menagerie, my poems. But they're completely show. Who could compete with the Northern Lights up there in the sky? 
but their complete show will entertain the centuries when I am long ago an island in dishonored grass who, who none but beetles know. It took me a long, long time to understand that this is ironic. Right? I mean, the Northern Lights are still here. And Emily Dickinson is long yeah, dead yeah. and gone. It is true. But you've all seen the Northern Lights. They last for half an evening. Her poems are still with us, right? I mean, this was written in the 1860s. And we're reading it in 2019. <coughs> so and there's a sense in which she understands that although she will die, and <coughs> she will be dead. And the, North, the universe keeps going on. It does say that. But it also says something else. It says that, that what she has done, these imitations of the Northern Lights, including this poem, will go on long after the Northern Lights have stopped, those particular Northern Lights. So she has it both ways. She is both mortal and has an ending, unlike the Northern Lights. And she has a, a length of accomplishment that's way, way greater than any display of the Northern Lights. Now, I'm done. You first, and then you second. But you first. Um, I'm kind of confused. Yeah. Because on our program, it says, an island in dishonored grass who none but daisies know. Yeah, and well. It says, but we don't know. I got a couple of things wrong in this. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a mistake in one of these lines. So your thing is wrong. I, I get it. <laughs> You see, she's a good reader. Does yeah, it say daisies? Yeah. 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 Daisies? No, I think it's beetles. I'm pretty sure it's beetles. But I, I could check it out. It's, it, but it's, thank you for catching me up on that. I, I made a mistake. I'm one or the other. But it still makes sense either way, right? The Northern Lights both are still with us, and she's dead. But those particular Northern Lights are gone, and her punks are still with us. Right? So, but thank you. And I cut you off. Well, I'm just trying to uh, figure out, of course, I imagine there's as many different answers as there is people in the room. What motivated her? She it didn't seem to be the money, because she wasn't turning them out to get a, a money for them. No. Evidently, she was born with a silver spoon in her mouth. No. She wasn't. How did she live in a beautiful house like that without having to income? See, there's this kind of illusion we have. Her father was an influential and wealthy lawyer, and her brother was an influential and wealthy lawyer, and she was uh, an unmarried girl in the house, and she took care of her father and her mother, and, and I'm not sure you would want to trade your life for taking care of your parents all their lives. Uh, I'm not sure that that's quite silver spoonish. Yeah, she, she had enough food. She had a good home. Um, but that's not quite silver spoon. The question of motivation is a very, very hard one. Um, I was talking with some friends beforehand. The, the story of the publication of her poems is pretty amazing. Uh, she sent some poems off to this guy who is an editor for a magazine, Thomas Wentworth Higginson. And her niece thought, ah, maybe these poems are pretty good. So they published a version, and they kind of modularized them. They, they changed them so they rhyme better, and they put punctuation instead of all these dashes, and, and uh, they shifted things around. Uh, and then a better version came out that's more attuned to what she actually wrote with dashes, and then an even better version came out. Uh, but the most recent version pointed out what has become very clear to scholars, which is that almost all these poems were copied out in fair copies in what are called fascicles. She made little books. And she sewed together the books with little bits of yarn. Right? She, she was a self-published poet. <laughs> the poems didn't go anywhere but in her drawer. And it wasn't doing it for money. <sighs> Question of fame is harder. But um, one of the really difficult things about Emily Dickinson is she was she's a really, really good poet. 
She's writing in the middle of the 19th century. You know who wrote poems in the middle of the 19th century? Guys. There wasn't much room for women poets. Or if they were, they were going to be sentimental. They were, they were not going to write about nature without her diadem. And, and it is thought, nobody knows for sure, that when she sent these poems off to, to uh, uh, the editor of The Atlantic, the poetry editor of uh, The Atlantic, Thomas Wentworth Dickinson, she was kind of testing, is the world going to acknowledge this? And to Higginson's credit, he knew there was something extraordinary in them. To his discredit, he thought they weren't good enough to publish. So, I, I mean, she was stuck. She was a, a, a woman poet in the 19th century that wouldn't acknowledge the women who could be great poets. And why did she write? I, I don't. It's a very good question, you know? I, 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 <coughs> even if people tell us, we don't know if we believe them. Yes? I just, something just occurred to me. I know some people that before they give away their books, they have to go through them again for fear that they would lose something that they know up to them. Maybe she wanted to go back and say, gee, whiskers, look what I did. Not like a woodpecker on the But world. the question is, why did she do it in the first place? Why did she write all these thoughts? Why did she put them into little books that she published herself? And I, I think, you know, that she didn't burn them when she died? Yeah, okay, I can understand that. But uh, I, I think we have a desire to make things of our life. And I think she tells us in enough of these poems that, that carefully observing the world was her way of going forward in the world. And, and so she made these careful observations it's what she could do with what she had, which was a life that had suffered tremendous, if we believe her poems, which I do, tremendous loss. I mean, she also had moments of happiness. Some of her poems are actually very sexual. You know, I'm not sure she had any sexual congress with anybody. Uh, her poems are about friendship. She put poems in letters. I, why do people do anything? <laughs> you know, those are very good questions. No, I, I mean, really, you're asking a very good question. Why did she do it? I, I think she didn't publish widely because there was no place for a woman in the 19th century to publish like she did, especially if they were on the cutting edge of poetry. I, 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 I mean, there's no other poet in the 19th century who is a woman who compares to her. There may be no other woman poet of all time who compares to her. There may be no poet, period, who compares to her. And she's an extraordinary poet. And yet she wrote in a kind of privacy. And we have other examples. You know, Kafka wrote most of what he wrote. And he wanted it burned when he died. And his friend said, oh, I wouldn't have left with me if he wanted it burned. He knows I admire him. I'll publish him. So Max Brun published Kafka. And, and, and Hopkins didn't want his poems published. His friends published them. Yes? Um, I, I really think the question is, how could she not write? <laughs> I mean, everyone here probably, we're all here for poetry uh, monkeys. All of us have probably written, scribbled a few lines here and there. And we may have had trouble with them. But you know what it feels like when you write something that, that kind of makes its way through very difficult right. stuff simply and easily with just a few words is magical. So, so it, I mean, she saw like that, that wonderful section where about the uh, how can we bear to have right. the bees come and how can, how can I can't, I dread the yes. first robin. Yeah. I mean, I love how she's going along and then she just goes off into that, um, that piece about, um, that makes no sense. If he'd be too tall, the tallest one could stretch to look at him. Yeah. It just really makes no sense. I love that. I love that she just wanders off a cliff, in a sense, and then lands adroitly and starts again. Let, let me argue against you, although I most no. agree with you. No, no I, I, I do. I, not everybody is good with words. Not is good with words. I, I went to the marvels of going to another country, and I go to France, and it's so hard to learn the language, or I don't think Portugal, or 
India, they won't understand the word. Little kids can speak it, right? So we all have language. But not everybody is so good with words. I love music a lot. I mean, really love music. I can't play anything. I can't compose anything. So she had, she was willing to forge in herself the capacity to use words. Uh, Joyce says near the end of Portrait of the Artist, uh, I go to forge in the smithy of my soul, the uncreated conscience of my race, as Stephen Douglas has said. Not everybody's willing to do that work. Not everybody has that talent. I, 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 so not everybody <coughs> can be a poet with words. I read something to the Vermont State Legislature today from Walt Whitman. He says everybody, if you practice of being a good person, can make your own life a poem. I mean, he's pretty astonishing, too. <laughs> so I don't know if everybody can make poems and have that great thrill. I don't know. We all have language. But she had an extraordinary capacity. And I, I relate it, and I, I'm not the expert here. You know, I've read a lot of Emily Dickinson. I've thought a lot about Emily Dickinson. But she would come down in the middle of the night and talk to me. So I don't know. I, I think it has to do with what she said in that poem I tell my hat I grease my shawl. She, she has to be scrupulously exact, because it's the only way she can get through. And I think that's part of why she writes poems. I think, as this poem we just did shows, I think she knew she had the capacity to make of the world she lived in a recreation of it, a simulacrum that was not as good as the real thing, and yet, in some ways, is better than the real thing, because it lasts, and it's captured, and, and it's there for us to understand. In a poem I, I love greatly, a poem by Rainer Maria Rilke, uh, the ninth of the well, she says, maybe that's what the world wants, is to be put into words, for, for things to turn into consciousness. Maybe, maybe that's what the world needs. I don't know. I, I really, I, I'm a little stunned before the idea that she could do this. I, I do agree with you. She needed to do it. People can do it. There's a great sense of accomplishment in doing it, whether they are published or not, whether you make money or not. I think it, I, I think in, in my heart of hearts, if she could have been published, if she could have got wide acclaim, I think she might have liked that. I, I don't think the world was ready for her in, in 1863 when she wrote most of these poems, or even 1880. And, and uh, it, if I, I, I read, I told somebody before I talked, I, I read in a book, Emily Dickinson is the greatest woman poet of all time. I said, you're right. Well, anybody want to propose another? There's Sappho. Sappho was a very great poet invented a lot of what we think and feel. Sappho wrote in Greece, and we have exactly one complete extant poem of hers. And all the rest are fragments. And they're little fragments, means a, a half a line or a line. 20th century, we have a couple of poets. I think, you know, I, I, I'm a great partisan of a Russian poet named Anna Matova, who I think is, is almost as good as Emily Dickinson. Elizabeth Bishop. Elizabeth Bishop? I love Elizabeth, but you know, Emily Dickinson, you could take Elizabeth, it's not a matter of just a quantity, but you could take Elizabeth Bishop's poems and in one hand and put Emily Dickinson's poems in the other hand, and this one, but that, she wrote so many great poems. Not many bad ones. Not many <laughs> Uh, I'm a great admirer of Elizabeth Bishop. I'm glad to be reminded of Elizabeth Bishop. Could, could yeah. we just spend a minute on craft? Yeah. Talk about all those dashes. Yes. yes. <laughs> you read through a lot of them and brought the yeah. brought meaning that I yeah. hadn't been able to find because you read through the dashes. But she put them in there. Dashes are, are a problem with, with Dickinson. Um, the first versions of Dickinson, the ones that came out in, in the first three editions of increasingly more poems, put punctuation in. And the thing about punctuation is that it gives us directions to do things. Stop, pause, comma, uh, excited, exclamation. 
And I, I think she managed to avoid all that, avoid deciding uh, finally what these lines should be. And, and I don't know. I mean, I mean, I don't know what to do about that. When I write I, myself, I use a lot of dashes. And when I revise, I take out the dashes. Because who wants so many dashes, right? <laughs> I don't think our, our mind works in night. Nice, neat little packages. And I think that's how the words came out of, of her. Not quite the nice, neat little packages. She put them with great craft into four light stanzas. And, and that, that rhyme uh, uh, stabbed them, uh, me, majesty. In fact, those are four light stanzas, even though they run together. Um, the dashes are just part of how she did things. This has been a really fast hour and a half. Do you want to do one more question, or do you want to do one, any closing? One questions? more question, and then I'll stand around and not avoid the question of dashes. Uh, yes, pardon me, because you already had one. That's fine. We could have two. I I want to use the word. I don't want to use the word depression, but I wanted to. I was thinking about the fact that in our culture we have such a go get them, perfect yourself, self-help culture that many people who suffer depression mask it totally. And I was thinking that Emily Dickinson, of course, lived in a, a certain orthodoxy and her vision of sort of isolation and alienation might have been um, very heretical and something that she needed to, um, in a way, right. uh, um, work through in her own way because the religious milieu was not going to, you know, if, if her faith did not make all of these issues um, her faith did issues. not sustain them she's very clear about that right and so is that a source of um, not shame but a need to protest her own meaning counter to the prevailing well, you know I think we some of you may disagree I mean, you know, that's not true you're not to believe what I say I think we have a lot more depression and despair than we have much oh, yeah. we're adrift uh, uh, in alcohol and opioids, we have huge numbers of prescriptions. Uh, young people seem more alienated and depressed than ever. And hide it so that people are so, shocked when it My sense is that Dickinson is writing about something that runs very deep in many people at times in their lives. There are moments of great joy. There are moments of of uh, a feeling of connection and belonging. She can write about those too. But there are also these moments of despair and of wondering how we go on. I, I mentioned before, maybe a little too quickly, everybody's parents died. How do we go on when we suffer loss and grief? How do we continue? I have a, several friends who have fixed can't think of anything worse who have outlived their children. How do we go on? And I think Emily Dickinson speaks to that, and it's much more common than we like to acknowledge, because we live in a technicolor world where everybody's happy, and everything is OK, and it's not. So I, that's, you know, and I, I think. And she doesn't mask that. She, she doesn't does mask not any of that. put a pretty face on no, it. No, she does not. She does not. Uh, we have one more. Okay. <laughs>